Welcome to this special episode of the Marketing Power Up Show. This is your host, Ramley John, and I just want to thank you for sticking around this 2023 to tuning into this new show that I launched in February and the newsletter attached to it. There are now over 5,000 subscribers and over 10,000 downloads of the show itself. So I just want to thank you for tuning in. If this is your first time uh, tuning into this show. Uh, I've had some amazing marketers share a power up that's helped them in their marketing campaigns as well as their career. People like April Dunford, Amanda Natividad, Kevin Indig, Ronnie Higgins, some of the people that will be tuning in uh, and listening to some recaps for this episode. But 2023 was an amazing year. I hope it was for you as well. I'll be doing a recap of my year, some of my highlights, my lowlights, as well as lessons learned, as well as what to expect for 2024 in the new year. One of the things that I'm excited for that I want to give you a little taste of is I'm going to be doing a, a, a bunch of series around this show now where each quarter i might have a series around certain things for example i'm planning a cmo series so i'll be reaching out to folks like a cmo of hubspot cmo of zapier maybe in cmo of lyft or another company that we all look uh, up to and just interviewing them and learning from a power up from their 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 career as well as their marketing leadership so that's something that's coming up in 2024 that i'm already planning for I'm most likely also going to be doing a whole series around uh, a, a series on content leaders. Uh, some people that I look up to, like Anne, Anne Hadley and other content leaders that uh, that I respect in different companies, including maybe even Spotify. I would love to hear from their director of content or head of content uh, as to how they plan out their content programs. But today we're just going to be tuning in to some of uh, the top five episodes of this year, some insights that really uh, a lot of us marketers can learn from. Of course, the first one is April Dunford when I interviewed her almost a year ago. Uh, She was cluing in that she was writing a second book as a follow-up to her book, Obviously Awesome. Sure enough, she launched it this year, Sales Pitch. Uh, I was one of the, I think I was one of the few, uh, first few where she gave a hint that she was writing a book. So this clip that we're about to listen to is about her telling a, a funny story. I really love it because it's visual. It talks about how it's really hard to buy things. And she talks about her story with buying a toilet, of all things toilet, and how hard it is to buy a toilet for our house. So let's tune in as to why buying is sometimes harder than selling so i got thinking about this you know how hard it is to buy stuff like sometimes i'll get pushback from founders on this and they'll say well you know our stuff is actually not that hard to buy you know it's not that hard to buy right. it's not that complicated whatever and i'm like no you don't understand like uh, things like this are really hard to buy and so i had this experience where um i might buy a new house it, not a new house, but an old shitty house. <laughs> the old shitty house has an old shitty bathroom. And uh, and I hire a guy to come renovate the bathroom. And the guy says, guy says uh, yeah, um, you're going to need to pick a new toilet. You got to go buy a toilet that I'm going to install it, whatever. And I said, oh, okay, toilet. Never bought a toilet before, but you know, how hard could it be? I'm going to go buy a toilet, go to the toilet store, walk in the toilet store and uh, toilet salesman walks up to me and says, Hey, can I help you? And I said, yeah, looking for a toilet. And he says, what kind of toilet do you want? Now I'm like, one that flushes? <laughs> one, that like, one that what? works. What do you mean? He goes, Oh, we got all kinds of toilets. Toilets are all back there. You know, go back to the thing and look at the toilets. And I'm like, okay. So I go back there and there's, there's like hundreds of toilets, oh, hundreds man. of toilets. <laughs> like, there's so many toilets. And the worst part is they all look the same but they are not the same. Like it's <laughs> all got these little, you know, sheets beside everyone. And it says, here's the price. Some of them are a hundred bucks. Some are a thousand bucks, and, but they look the same. And then there's this list of features underneath and it's gobbledygook. Like, I don't know what any of these things mean. And so they're talking about gravity assisted BF4, you know, whether or not there's cut a flapper. I'm like, I don't know what a flapper is. I don't know what any of this stuff is. <laughs> So I'm in there looking at all this stuff. I spend like an hour in the store looking at this thing, and I and I come to this conclusion. I'm like, oh shit, I don't even, I don't know enough to be able to buy a toilet. 
Mm. Like crap. So I go home, I get on the internet and, and, and there's all this stuff. Like there's like, I go to consumer reports and they've got the thing about toilets. Oh my God, there's 59 things you got to think about with toilets. There's like single flush, dual flush, seed height, all this, how it flushes, flappers, trapways, all this stuff. I'm like, oh my God, there's all this stuff. And like, I don't want to know anything about toilets. Like, I just want to buy a toilet that does not break. Like, I don't want to buy a bad toilet because I don't want to be calling a plumber every week. I just want a toilet that works. And so I get this idea. Like, so I'm freaking out. I spend like three weeks going back and forth to the showroom, looking at toilets, and I, ah, I can't make a decision. And so finally I get this bright idea. Like, I'm not going to buy any toilet. I'm going to buy no toilet. I'm going to keep the old toilet. The old toilet was working just fine. Right. Just fine. So then I'm like, that's it, right? So I spent three weeks. I went to the showroom two, three times. I spent like infinity on the internet. How many toilets did I buy? Zero, zero. That's just like what's happening with your buyers, right? They're paralyzed. They're looking at all this stuff. They can't figure out. They can't make a choice. And we're basically going to them and going, blah, 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 Here's all the features. And they're like, I don't know. Any of these features matter? I don't know. How do I pick between this one and that one? I don't know. And so we're doing exactly that. And so what happened for me, so this is funny. I go to my contractor and I'm like, hey, I, you know, I've decided I'm not going to buy a toilet. Like, I'm a busy <laughs> person. I got stuff going on. I got kids. I got a dog. You know, I'm too busy. And and the guy says, look, lady, like we took the toilet out of here. We recycled it. It's gone. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Can't keep the old toilet. Not an option. And I'm like, right. oh, my contractor, he's burned the boats, right? Like, oh, my gosh, shit. Now I got to go back and buy the toilet. So, so I go back into the toilet store. I go to a different toilet store guy comes up and says, can I help you? And I said, yes, I cannot leave here without a toilet. Like, oh my God, I got to buy a toilet today. This is terrible. And the guy's like, oh yeah, buy a toilet. It's really hard. And I'm like, yes, it is. Why are there so many choices? Why are there all these features? I don't even want to, like, I just want to, I just want to buy a toilet work. And the guy says, look, I'm going to teach you how to buy toilets. He says, it's easy. You only need to think about three things. Quality, aesthetics, price. That's all we got to think about. And I'm like, okay, teach me toilet Obi-Wan. <laughs> and the guy says, yeah. First thing, quality. See all these ones over here? They're like 200 bucks. All these ones over here, like a thousand bucks. It's a quality thing. All those mm. features you're talking about, like flappers and trapways and all that stuff. Higher quality toilet lasts a lot more flushes before you, you got to do maintenance on it. Low quality toilet doesn't last that many flushes. And I'm like, well, who the hell buys a low quality toilet? And he's like, well, actually, like not all toilets get used a lot. Like some people have more than one toilet in their house and they got one in the basement. It gets flushed like once a month or something. He said, you'd be dumb to buy the really expensive one because this one's barely ever going to get flushed. Like you should buy one of these, put it in there. Like, you know, maybe it's for your cottage or something. And I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I said, well, look, this is actually my primary toilet. So I don't want one of those little colleague ones. I want one of these. So, okay, fine. Forget about all those. Okay, good. We just narrowed the choices down by half. He goes, okay, second thing is aesthetics. Some people got a real look they're going for in their bathroom. Like they want their toilet to be super modern or they want it to be gold or whatever. And you'll pay way more for that. For that. So if, but if you got an aesthetic thing you're going for, then just look at these are the fashion toilets. And I'm like, look, I got no fashion, fashion requirements. <laughs> Forget about that. So he said, okay, well, don't look at any of those ones in the corner. Forget about those. And I'm like, this is good. We're getting down there. And then he says, okay, last thing is space. A lot of people got a really tiny spot for a bathroom. And so they got some kind of toilets where the tank goes in the wall and that saves you like six inches or something. And so you can put the toilet in a way smaller spot. Problem is, if something breaks with the tank, you got to bust through the drywall to get in there and fix it. So that's the downside. So if you got a little wee space or you want to save some space, you go with the one on the wall. If you don't, you just give a regular one. I'm like, look, I got lots of space. I don't want to be busting out the wall if this thing breaks. So forget about those. This is fantastic. Now I'm down to three toilets. And I'm like, holy crap, this is great. I only got Amazing. three toilets. Which one would you pick? And the guy says, look, lady, I got to come clean with you. I actually work for Toto. Mm. So I'm going to tell you to buy the Toto toilet. But the other two toilets are fine too. They're all the same. Toto one costs you a little bit more. But I'll tell you, the reason I work for the company, I really believe in what they do. They get you know really high quality ratings. All the reviews are really high. You can go home and research it on the internet. I'm like, no freaking way. I'm not going back to the internet to research toilet stuff. And, and he says, if you just want to buy a toilet, never think about toilets again. That's the one you pick. I'm like, sign me up. Bought the toilet. Done. 10 minutes in and out. So think about that. It was that guy being a pushy salesperson? No, no, he didn't say, hey, here's the total one, here's why you should buy it. No, didn't do that at all. Uh, two, was he trying to like overwhelm me with a whole bunch of features like we do in software? 
where we come in and we say, hey, I'm giving you the demo and I'm going to show you every single feature and talk about, no, he didn't. What that guy was, who's acting like a guide, and he's basically painting a picture of all the toilets in all the land and giving me a rubric to say, these ones are like this, these ones are like this, and these ones are like this. And depending on what you're looking for, here's how to narrow down the field. So what he's doing is giving me a way to look at the whole market and make a super confident choice myself. Now, I think we can do this in software, but we don't. And we don't for a whole bunch of reasons. One is we've been taught to never, ever talk about anybody but us, right? Don't talk about the competition. We don't want to be bashing the competition. Now, look, did my toilet guy bash the competition? No, he did not. In fact, he would have sold me a cheap, crummy toilet if I had told him, no, this is just a toilet that never gets used in the basement or whatever. Like the guy would have sold me that toilet. So, so but we've been told that we can't talk about the, we got to pretend the competitors don't exist, we're just going to give you a pitch and it's, it's just about us. So that's the first thing. The second thing is we are under this impression that no one wants to hear our opinion, which is wrong, which is wrong. Because we've got this idea like, you know, we're biased. Nobody will believe us. And I'm telling you, I, if I'm talking to a sales rep, I do want to hear their opinion because you know what? I've never bought a thing like this before. I don't know anything about this. And you and we, as the vendors, know a lot. We're experts on this. We eat, sleep, and breathe this. We know the market better than anybody else. Why wouldn't we want to express our opinion about what's good and bad in the market? And leave it to the customer to decide whether or not to believe us, right? And if we can do this in a credible way, being as unbiased as we can, this is exactly what customers want from us. And so... So my thinking on this is we do a lot of thinking in marketing about talking about the value that our product can deliver that no one else can, but we do a really, really bad job when that prospect gets over to sales and sales has to deliver a pitch that says, look, here's, here's your choices and here's why and when you would pick us. I don't think we are arming the sales team with a story that lets them do what my toilet salesman did um, to give customers that have never bought a product like yours before a, a way of thinking about the whole market and a way to confidently say, yeah, this is the one that I want. The second clip is from Ronnie Higgins. He's the director of content at Open Phone. He talked about something that I really, really enjoy. Walt Disney. <laughs> I love uh, Disney movies, I grew up watching Mickey Mouse and Pluto and everything else. And I remember going to Disneyland with my family and just having great memories. And he shared about Disney's synergy map and how it's helped him with his content. Another great thing about Ronnie is that he's such a good guy. We've chatted a few times after this recording. We've, I would say we've become good friends after this. In this clip here, he talks about one key to the content kingdom as he talks about the importance of nowadays of grabbing attention over fame and fortune let's tune in i i called it the six keys to the content kingdom okay. and the the first key is forget about fame and fortune focus on attention mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter like who you're competing against like okay right. you have if you're a b2b SaaS company right like let's take open phone as an example yeah. like we have other phone competitors. We compete against Verizon and AT&T because some people think getting a business phone means going down and getting another a second iPhone. Yeah. So, but those people are not always in the, you know, purchasing like our buyer mode, but what content can do in that mere exposure effect is it increases the amount of attention that we have and the amount of value in that relationship. Mm -hmm. That's why like the whole community thing is like, followed on the coattails of content because content literally creates community. There's a reason there's fandoms, right? Yeah. Like Disney, period. There are apparently Disney like gangs, like families who like, I don't know. I, I read about that and it was kind of funny because it was like joke. There were people fighting over who could like take a picture in front of a fountain at Disney. And I was like, oh, that's sad. <laughs> but that's uh, yeah. anyways, like, it creates fandoms. It creates like uh, it's 
I always see content as the like watering hole or the water cooler for yeah. a community or a fandom. And when you can do it right and you can do it right with that sort of uh, synergy strategy, modernization strategy, and you can, it's that exposure. And so when someone is starting a new business and they realize, yeah. hey, I need a business phone. Mm. Hey, uh, I got all that really good advice and, you know, learned about, you know, stories from other small business owners from that company open phone. Let me check out their thing. Before I continue, I want to thank the sponsor for this episode, 42 Agency. Now, when you're in scale-up growth mode and you have to hit your KPIs, the pressure is on to deliver demos and signups, and it's a lot to handle. There's demand gen, email sequences, rev ops, and more. And that's where 42 Agency, founded by my good friend Camille Rexton, can help you. They're a strategic partner that's helped B2B SaaS companies like Profit Wall, Teamwork, Sprout Social, and HubDoc to build a predictable revenue engine. If you're looking for performance experts and creatives to solve your marketing growth problems today and help you build the foundations for the future, look no further. Visit 42agency.com to talk to a strategist right now to learn how you can build a high efficiency revenue engine, or you can also find that link in the show notes and description. Well, that's it for now. Let's get back to the episode. That was great. Let's jump into the third clip. This is with Talia Wolf. She is the founder of Get Uplift. I actually interviewed her almost five or six years ago for my first podcast, Growth Marketing Today, where we talk about emotional targeting. In this uh, episode, she goes deeper into the emotions involved. Particularly, she has some interesting insight from Google that buying for the B2B experience is actually more emotional sometimes than the consumer side and that sounds like it's counterintuitive because when you're buying for your friends or family you think obviously there's going to be emotional but actually she has some stats and insights why b2b buying is almost as emotional or even more emotional buying experience let's jump in you know we do a lot of um experiments for both b2c and b2b and we've actually found that in b2b there's even more complexity yeah. involved because um, really, so let me give you an, an example. There's two different emotional triggers that come back over and over again that keep coming up with in SaaS and in B2B in general, um, which are uh, social image and self image. Now, as mm -hmm. a reminder, I said what Google found was that if someone in an organization sees personal value, they're far more likely to buy that product. So self-image is how I feel about myself. When I buy a product, how am I going to feel about myself? Am I going to feel proud? Am I going to feel smarter? Am I going to feel more educated? Is it going to make me feel more confident in what I do at work? Social image is what are people going to think about me? Are they going to think I'm a rock star? Or are they going to be, you know, make me the person they go to when they have a question? All of these are factors that people take into consideration in a B2B purchase. And we've seen this time and time again. So a lot of the times when we're writing conversion copy for a comparison page or a home page or product page uh, for SaaS, we're taking these emotional levers into consideration. What does this person behind the screen need to feel about themselves? What do they want other people to think about them? when purchasing a product, and that's important. All right, let's jump into the fourth clip. It is with Kevin Lee and Shannon Deep. They talked about brand marketing and storytelling. Now, you might not know this about me, but I actually studied mathematics in my undergrad in university. And I think deep down inside of me, I'm a creative, and I love them just talking about the importance of branding and creativity and storytelling as a differentiator. What I also love about this conversation is that it the three of us were so far apart, but we were able to record this episode. Shannon was based out of is based and it's now based out of Paris, France. While Kevin uh, Lee is actually based out of Boise, Idaho. While me, I'm in Toronto, Canada, and we just really connected about this. When they launched their consultancy and company Bonfire, uh, my this episode was actually part of their launch strategy. They were emailing back and forth about this. Now, Bonfire is a, their consultancy and education company around branding and, and storytelling that they got a chance to work at together at 
a few companies including Oyster and Rattle. So let's tune in in, in them telling a, a story about the power of storytelling. They share two stories. Kevin talks about uh, a story that he read from Ogilvy. It's like one of the like grandfather. <laughs> They're the grandfather of advertising. And Shannon talks about a story about the three little pigs. And it might sound like they're very far apart, but they really capture the essence of why storytelling can be the differentiator for your company, even at a very early stage. Let's jump in. Yeah, I mean, I think it's such a differentiator for companies today. And, and yeah, that story um, from the book Alchemy, which is written by, I think he is like a senior vice president or something at the Ogilvy Agency. So. He knows his stuff about brand. And uh, the anecdote is that um, this advertising agency used to ask this test for aspiring copywriters. And one of the questions was, here are two identical 25 cent coins, quarters. Sell me the one on the right. And one candidate thought it through the problem and was like, okay, I'll take the right hand coin. I'll dip it in Marilyn Monroe's bag. Then I will sell you a genuine quarter as previously owned by Marilyn Monroe. And I just love that anecdote because ultimately we're selling the same thing at the end of the day, but the way that you talk about it, the the, the universe of story that you build around a thing can totally impact the value and the perception of that thing. I think that is what brand can do, especially in like today's culture and markets where there's so much saturation of things. Yeah, I think that's such a, it's such an important point to remember that there are eight different ways you could sell the same thing. Um, you know, you could you could tell the story of the three little pigs as a tragedy. You could tell the story of the three little pigs as a comedy, or you could tell the story of the three little pigs from the wolf's point of view. And these pigs are in his neighborhood gentrifying it, and he like needs to get them out. You know, like there are, and the that. angle that you take <laughs> really reco- you know, and like that is your brand. Like, is your brand the wolf? Is your brand the comedy or is your brand the tragedy? And it's it's all part of the but but your but the base story uh, or the base thing that you're selling doesn't change. And I I think another really great example of that is the significant objects project. Um, I think Kevin, you and I have talked about this before, but um, you can look it up. It's it's still like extant, and they have a book and everything. And um, uh, yeah, it was a, a group of it was kind of half art project, half sociological experiment where they bought like a bunch of crap, like just like cheap things from like dollar stores or from thrift stores, uh, you know, that cost them maybe a total of like $20 or something. And then they took each thing and they worked with an artist. They worked with a a writer to give it a backstory, a fictional, obviously backstory. And they put it on eBay and they saw, uh, and they weren't like, uh, you know, deceiving people. It was like, this is the the art story that goes with this object and they saw how much money they could sell the objects for. And it was like something like a 900% increase in like what they, I I don't know the exact number. Don't quote me on that, but it was, it was an exponential increase in what people were willing to pay because they got, it made them feel something. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a little plastic toy horse that cost 50 cents. It was a story. Yeah. I think one of the ways I've experienced this and Shannon and I, we talked about my love of water, which is like <laughs> kind of silly. But like, if you think of water as like one of the biggest commodities that there could ever be, like there are still so many water brands if you go into the store. And like, what is, how do you sell water in a unique and differentiated way? And you can do it so much through branding. Like there's water that is all about, uh, you know, being in an aluminum can and water that's all about being sourced from Fiji. There's water that is like, think of like Liquid Death, which is, I don't even know how to describe the Liquid Death brand. Like, I think, but it's all at the end of the day, it's water. And for most people, and if I'm being honest, probably me, like it all tastes the same, but like the brand is different. And that brand is what differentiates and tells the story, even for like huge commodities like water. In this last clip, it is somebody that I actually just met this year, but I would say that we've become friends. Uh, I, I was on her show and as well as we've chatted back and forth about our hobbies. One of our hobbies is uh, doing puzzles that are extremely hard. She sent me a picture of a puzzle that she does. It's like pure black. I'm like, how do you do a puzzle that's pure black? If you already know her, uh, you probably have the name in mind already. But if you're not, her name is Fio Doceto. She is the senior content strategist at float.com. And in this episode, we dug into her easy framework. But one of the things that I really loved is that 
when you think about content, you think that content is so easy to copy. You can take somebody else's content and just repurpose it or reword it and you can take it your own. But she shares some strategies to make it into a defensible mode, something that can be a differentiator that is super hard for your competitors to copy. So let's tune in to this episode, this clip from my conversation with Vio DeSetto. Sorry, and I was going to say it's hard to copy somebody's opinions. I mean, you know, everybody can plagiarize everybody else. We all know, but, you know, it's, it's a little bit harder, I think, mm. and also makes your content stand out. Because um, as I said before, like everybody, technically, everybody can just do the same research that I did and write the same thing I did just using sources that you find on Google or existing content or, you know, watching YouTube videos, et cetera, whatever. So what are you adding in that is different from everybody else? What is uniquely yours? And I think mm. I actually sneakily am talking about the easy framework right now. Yes, aren't I? <laughs> I was going to say I that. I just said uniquely yours. So there you right. go. <laughs> The, the ideal way to create content that is, you know, helpful and convincing and good really about anything is to match um, topical expertise on one end or sorry, topical complexity on one end with um, subject matter expertise. But we as content marketers, we often find ourselves in a situation where the topic is complex and we don't have a matching level of expertise. And if we just try to force our way into it, we might not have excellent results. So to give an example, um, I worked for Postmark, you mentioned before, this is an email delivery service. And prior to getting to Postmark, I had never in my life even wondered how emails get delivered. Like to me, it's just a thing like you click, the email gets delivered, the end. And there is so much more to it than that, obviously, but I couldn't possibly plan or execute convincing content around email deliverability on my own and never mind convince other people to use our product after reading it. So one thing I could do, and I obviously did, was piece information together, um, you know, through independent research and Googling, et cetera, but so can anybody else. And this is where actually the distinctive element in the work comes from talking to experts who can share, you know, verifiable information and tangible data point and even unique and controversial opinions. And, and you can use them and you can use interview transcripts as your foundations. Um, so it doesn't mean that you have to become the expert, um, but you have to learn how to leverage other people's expertise. And so if you're, if you're writing about a topic, you can ask questions such as, you know, um, how would you define this topic for a beginner? And how do you talk about this topic to your peers? Because there may be a difference. What is something that non-experts believe about this topic and they're wrong about? Um, you know, what's the most common reason people struggle with this topic? And then if you're talking about the product, you can ask other types of questions like, you know, what problems are you facing when you first looked for the product? Um, what objections did you have? How's your life changed since using it? What can you do now that you couldn't before? And what would you do if you couldn't use the product anymore? So, you know, it's, it's, it's different kinds of questions um, and you can balance them and deploy them strategically depending on what it is that you're trying to create, I guess. That's it. I actually want to share one more as a bonus. It is actually with Georgiana Lottie. They just launched their book. Her and Claire Solendrop, they launched their book, Forget the Funnel. And she was one of the very first episodes I launched this show with. And she digs into why the importance why it's so important to do customer research, particularly getting inside your best customers' heads. And I love how she puts that. And she shares some of the benefits of doing that. Now, sure, you might have heard it before, talk to your customers. But in her book, she actually goes deep into why it's important, how to do it, how to get the insights based on your conversations and your research. And like I said, if you haven't gotten the book before, you should check it out. But let's jump into this short clip on why it's important to get into your best customers' heads. In terms of what you learn um, and what you can what you can learn from these best customers, we like to use the Jobs to Be Done framework to guide our research. Um, when we run surveys, they're all open text 
uh, responses, uh, interviews, very similar questions, but again, they're very uh, jobs focused. So it's for, for those that aren't familiar with the jobs to be done framework, it's basically based on this theory that um, customers buy a better version of themselves, right? They're not buying your product, they're buying what your product allows them to do. And so we're trying to pull at that. And there's some really interesting and amazing questions um, that we ask when we do types, this type of research. And one of them is, you know, what was it that led you to sign up for our product today? That's not exact wording, but something along those lines. We're basically, we were figuring out, you know, what was going on in that person's life that convinced them that the way that they're solving the problem today or in that moment wasn't good enough anymore. And they had to, they had to fire their existing solution in order to hire another one. And if you can understand what that moment is for your customers, you can understand how to market to them. You can understand what your messaging um, and even partially what your positioning could be, right? Who you're up against in that market, right? What solution are you asking them to fire in order to hire your solution? That, that communicates to you. You learn from them on, you know, what are the specific parts about their current solution that are very, that are painful and how is your solution the sort of antidote to that? So that's really insightful. There's a number of questions. Um, another one of my favorite questions when we run uh, research like this is, what was the moment that you knew um, that our product was going to solve this problem for you? And the answer to that question can do a ton, obviously, in terms of figuring out what your, you know, your differentiators are, what your competitive advantages are, your messaging, of course, like on your website and potentially in your messaging. But my favorite application of that question is actually how the product onboarding can be influenced by that answer as well, right? And to figure out what is it, what parts of our products should we introduce in what order? What do they care about most? Um, so again, it gives you messaging and, and sort of the hierarchy of messaging, but it also gives you insight into how to introduce the product to begin with once they get into the, once they get into the product. Um, I mean, I've got lots of examples of uh, companies that we've worked with where we've learned really interesting things um, and we're able to influence not only the messaging and positioning on the website, but also product onboarding, even uh, uncover expansion opportunities post-acquisition, um, all because of that style of research, which is very, uh, you know, sort of qualitative and, and digs at the why uh, customers are choosing you, what leads them to reach out to you, and why do they choose you over all the other options? Well, there you go. Those are the top six episodes of Marketing Power Ups. Thank you so much for tuning in. I have so much more exciting things coming up for 2024. Like I mentioned earlier, I have a CMO series where I'm going to be interviewing folks from uh, CMO of HubSpot, hopefully Spotify. I'm going to reach out to them to see if I can get them. The teamwork.com and uh, um, bit.ly and there's so much cool stuff that, that's coming up 2024 as well as if you're already not already subscribed to the newsletter marketingpops.com you can check out the newsletter I, I share more information and free cheat sheets that you can get directly from each new episode I also share a little bit more about my personal life for example in a few days I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sharing my a 2023 recap where I share some of the highlights for my year for me and my family. One of them is being able to travel to London, UK and Paris, France, as well as some of the lowlights that I've had this year. One of them being my father had uh, a little bit of a health scare this year, but I don't want to give away too much. Go check it out at the newsletter. And, and some of the lessons learned, including doing less and being great at them. So go check it out there. Once again, it's marketingpowerups.com where you can get it. But that's all for this episode. Have a happy holidays and a happy new year. And uh, here's to an even more amazing and awesome 2024 for you, your family, your business, your career, and everything in between. Have a powered up year. I'll talk to you soon. Marketing Power Ups. Until the next episode.